I truly believe that everyone's purpose on this earth is to help other people on this earth. Uh, and you just have to find what you love, what you're good at, and the way you can help people the, the most and just dive deep and charge into that. What's up, everyone? You're listening to the Do Hard Things podcast by Elite SRS. The purpose of this show is to share stories of hardship and victory as an encouragement for those in the middle of their own hard thing. Because we know hardship produces perseverance, which produces character, which ultimately produces hope. Today's guest is Kevin Ogar. Kevin is the owner of CrossFit Watchtower in Colorado, a global speaker for adaptive training, and a staff member for CrossFit HQ. Kevin shares the story of his paralysis in 2014 that left him with just a 15% chance of survival. He shares how he was granted a crystallized purpose through his near-death experience that has shaped him into the man he is today. Kevin reminds us that identifying our purpose transforms any difficulty into opportunity, and that is found most clearly through faith in Christ. If you enjoy the show, please don't forget to subscribe or leave a review so more people can be encouraged by the stories we share. Now, here's the conversation with Kevin Ogar. Okay, we got Kevin Ogar on the Do Hard Things podcast. Kevin, thanks for hopping on. No, thanks for having me. Yeah, looking forward to hearing your story. But uh, before we get too in the weeds, let's give some broader context for, for folks who maybe haven't heard of you. Um, and I like to do that by asking the question, when people ask you what you do, uh, how do you answer that? Oh, what I do. Um, I do a few things. Uh, I own a gym with my wife. I work for CrossFit HQ. I own a company called Wheelwad that works with adaptive athletes, and I help uh, with adaptive training seminars, uh, across the world, across the world. Mm -hmm. Wow. You just stated that really casually, but, uh, that's kind of a big statement. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I've been very blessed that I get to travel around to a lot of cool places and just hang out and like Reebok and Noble pants and talk fitness. <laughs> uh, very specifically those pants, um, uh, they get, they, they give them to me. So I don't, I mean, I'm not going to buy other ones. No, I wouldn't either if I were you. I do that with our stuff, and it's definitely not as high quality as that. So uh, apparel anyways. So, okay, you mentioned four different categories. Mm -hmm. All of it's within CrossFit. Mm -hmm. So so broadly speaking, you your career and the things you do are, are baked into the CrossFit uh, environment and world. Um, yes, very much so. How long ago did you get involved with CrossFit? And what were you doing before that? I started CrossFit in 2007, so okay. 16 years ago. Um, before that, I was being a knucklehead in college. Um, just not, not, not doing a lot of great stuff, probably drinking a little too much, playing rugby. Um, that was about it. Okay. So you, you got into CrossFit pretty early on for CrossFit mm -hmm. and for yourself, it sounds like um why have you stuck with it obviously there's opportunity there for you but um I mean I've been lifting since I was 12 so for the last 25 ish years um in some form competing with barbells powerlifting, weightlifting crossfit as well and um you know in college obviously like I was I was drinking too much I was not doing what I was supposed to be doing I uh I found crossfit actually because I got kicked out of college okay and and um started training people to make money and then the person that i worked with or my boss at the time convinced me to try crossfit and um i was just a fat power lifter like waddle in lift heavy things waddle back out <laughs> and uh he convinced me to try crossfit and i was horrible at it and i was like well this seems like something i should pursue and fell in love with it i uh, realized that not only was it a great way to like work out and get fitter uh, but it was a great way to start solidifying community and like bringing people together. Mm. Mm. I, okay. Let's talk about that. Like mindset that you just described. Mm -hmm. uh, you were terrible at it and you thought this is something I should do. Yeah, <laughs> I, I have. 
I have a bad habit of going, well, I suck at that. I'm going to do that more. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's not, it's not a bad habit, but it's a habit no. of mine where it drives my wife crazy. She's like, why do you continue to do that? I'm like, well, cause I'm so bad at it and I want to get better at it. <laughs> so, uh, I got two questions for that one. Where did that come from? Cause that's not super common. I don't think. And then two, uh, what, what are some like things on the list that you're like, oh yeah, I, whether you, you know, maybe you've conquered it at this point or you're still working on, uh, cause you suck at mm. it. Um, I think it comes from, I mean, I had a really great upbringing. I had great parents. They taught me a lot. Uh, mom and dad are, are two of my favorite humans. Um, they really kind of forced us to take a step back and look at who we are and where we want to drive the boat. And uh, I started playing sports when I was younger and, uh, you know, I played multiple sports and I would suck at all of them and I would like, you know, not really want to quit, but be really frustrated. And I remember just like, my dad would always be like, well, you have to get, you have to practice the things you're bad at if you want to get better at things. Mm. And so I just practice a ton of stuff. Uh, you know, I loved training and I think that's a lot of where that came from. I always saw that when I, did the things that were hardest for me the best things would come out of it and i would get a lot better a lot faster than if i ignored them okay cool well uh so you've got a crossfit gym you've mm -hmm. got the trainings that you do around the world you're mm -hmm. part of HU, and then you also do more adaptive training i think is what you said was the fourth one um yeah so mm -hmm. which one like is it 25 25 25 25 and like the percent of your time which one uh, do you enjoy doing the most and which one takes, like, where's your time go amongst those four? Uh, you know, I have full-time role with CrossFit, which is great. I get to talk to affiliates across my region and help them be more successful and, and discuss with them, like their, their needs and, and how I can help them. So that, that's a lot of my time. I mean, that's a full-time role. Yeah. I think that, I think that, and, uh, the gym are my two big ones. The, the seminars are kind of whenever they need me and maybe like, you know, six to 10 a year. Okay. Um, so not super frequent, uh, but a lot of time is spent at the gym with my wife. We kind of feel like that's our, that's our calling. Um, mm. You know, we have a great chance to uh, chat with people, create community, help people through hard times. Um, you know, really, really discuss things that matter with, with people who come into the door. I think cross the gyms are unique in the sense that we, are more than just gyms there's a giant community aspect to it and uh gives you the opportunity to influence and and help people with more than just fitness yeah so is that the is that the part of those four things that you uh get the the most i don't know if meaning is the right word but like joy or it sounds like it you know listening to you yeah. describe it but <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's our, it's my purpose. Um, I think I was truly put on this earth to, uh, to help those around me. I've always thought that my entire life and whatever, whatever way, you know, God kind of directs me to help those people, then that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Um, right now, right now it's through fitness. And if that changes, then it changes. Right. So, so 2007, you started CrossFit. When did you start mm -hmm. the gym? 2015. Okay. So, so started Cross 2007. Uh, crossfitted for a couple of years, started competing, moved up to Colorado in 2009, uh, started and continued competing. Um, I was working for another gym up until 2015 and that gym shut down. So I opened my own in 2015. Okay. So you watched one fail and we're like, that's probably going to be really hard. I'm going to do that. Well, so I, I, I got paralyzed in 2014. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm paralyzed from the waist down. Yeah. Um, and I went back to the gym I was working at. Uh, the gym owner, unfortunately, made some poor life choices um, that I couldn't morally stick around with. I asked him to correct it. He refused. And so I left. Mm. Okay. But I had, I had spent six years coaching, you know, six, seven classes a day, five days a week, you know, and had really helped grow and to try to help build that. And so when it shut down, I saw a need and I saw a community that was struggling. And so um, I actually never planned on being an affiliate owner. Uh, but I felt like it was the right thing to do, so I did it. If you enjoy the podcast, please do us a favor and head to your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review. It helps a ton. And there's a reason all the podcasts you listen to ask you to do this. We want to continue to encourage people in the middle of their difficult seasons, and your ratings help boost our podcast visibility and the stories of our guests. Did you pause it and leave a review? If so, thank you. All right, all right.
back to our conversation. Talk about, you know, for seven years, you know, coming out of college, doing CrossFit, not paralyzed, mm. Yep. you know, and then, you know, the last nine years now that's been the case. So what happened? Uh, I was in, I was a competitive CrossFitter. That's what I did. I, I lifted weights and did fitness for time um, and people paid me to do so. Um, I was in a competition, like a warm-up competition in California, which wasn't actually CrossFit. It was just a competition to kind of warm yourself up for bigger events. And someone stacked some bumper plates behind me that shouldn't have been there. I went to go bail backwards with the barbell and my bumper plates connected with the bumper plates that shouldn't have been there and ricocheted back into my back. Uh, severing my spine at, between T11 and T12. A complete severing, tore it right in half. Where, where uh, around your... I think hips, like right at my hips. Okay. Um, and uh, doctors told me it was the equivalent of having a car hit me going seven, 70 miles an hour. Um, and Whoa. luckily, I, I was blessed enough to, uh, you know, survive that because of past things like having been a lifter since 12, having been living in Colorado and having higher blood, red blood cell count. Um, you know, just a lot, a lot of small things meshed together to, to keep me alive. I had a 10 to 15% chance of surviving my first surgery. Um, I spent oh. like two or three, I spent like, Did yeah. Did you know two, that before the surgery? Yeah. Uh, well, the doctor came in and after he told me I was paralyzed and told me I had to have surgery, uh, and he has, and he told me that there was like a very low chance of me coming back. And I said, well, why, why do the surgery? Then it's like, I had an option either don't do the surgery and have a hundred percent chance of death or do the surgery and have a 50, 50 up to 15% chance of surviving. Well, when he puts um, it that way, it's, it's an easier choice. Yeah. So I, I spent like, I think it was like the next couple, I was had some drugs in my system, you know, for the pain, yeah. um, uh, but I think I spent the next couple hours calling people that I loved that weren't in the area and like letting them know that I probably wasn't going to survive. And, you know, I was just saying, saying my goodbyes and stuff. So. And did you know your uh, wife, were you married at this point? I wasn't married at this point. Okay. No. Okay. No. So take me back to that, that like conversation with the doctor of, mm -hmm. Hey, hundred percent chance you die or 15% chance of living. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Which, you know, when you put it that way, great framing to like pursue the 15% chance of living, but yeah. what, like, why were you going to die? You know, obviously it was serious, but what was causing so, it to be so, so serious? So uh, I had my two vertebrae and they had been knocked out of place. So it was about, I think it was like two or three inches in two different directions had been knocked out of place. Uh, my body was going into shock. My spinal cord was completely severed. Um, and so like ha not, not going in there and fixing it isn't an option. Like your body will freak out and you will eventually die from that. Just because um, your body doesn't know what to do with it. Yeah. Just, there's so much trauma going on there that they have to, that to realign things and fix it. Um, okay. So, yeah. Wow. So, so when you first, I, you said you sat with it for a minute, do you remember like the, the tension that you were feeling, uh, in that moment? when the doctor told you that was your situation or is it uh, like, how clear is that? You know, I, I remember having a moment of like freaking out a bit, uh, you know, crying, no, like being told that you're going to die is a big thing. Yeah. You know? Um, and so I had that for a little bit and then you kind of settle down. Uh, you, you take stock of the situation and realize that like, there's not much you can do about it. You gotta, you gotta trust that the plan for your life is the plan for your life. And, Mm. Um, and so I actually started making jokes about it and I don't, I don't think anyone else in the room appreciated it, but I, I, <laughs> I enjoyed it. Uh, and so, yeah, just kind of got on with it. Mm. So how long was the process from, you know, that first conversation with the doctor, this is, and then you making a decision to go into surgery and coming out the other side, like, okay, I'm stable. I'm going to live like, this is my you know, new normal. Uh, you know, I, it's a story my dad tells, uh, cause I was obviously on a lot of drugs after that first surgery. Yeah. The only thing I remember about coming out of my first surgery is I've never felt more peaceful in my entire life. Not I've because of the drugs, but just because just, of I felt sure and peaceful and I wasn't freaking out and everything was fine. And you know, the story my dad tells me is that he, like, he's upset and he's kind of freaking out and he's like, you're right. And I'm like, yeah, like I'm alive. God has a plan for me. 
obviously because I'm still here and right. you know we may not know what it is yet but we're going to figure it out mm. and I think that was it you know and then waking up to such great support from the CrossFit community um you know having seen what the CrossFit community can do like what are you going to do and not not push forward not try to survive not pay back the love that they gave you so yeah it's pretty pretty easy decision wow so can you talk about you know the the realization that you're alive and that there's a purpose for it Mm -hmm. because it like i guess in your situation and in that story it's like oh well yeah you know it's like really crystallized that there's something that i'm supposed to be doing because Mm -hmm. i probably should have died yeah but I, there's so many ways I could ask this question. I think let's just take it physically. Like everybody has a life, right? That's, that's going on right now. They're alive, but it's very rare that people have like this realization of purpose that you're mm-hmm. talking about and yours, you know, came through this traumatic event. Um, some people find it other ways, but it's not super common that people walk around with that in their mind. And so yeah. I'm curious how, how present that is for you like on a day-to-day basis, you know, being now nine years removed, like, has it stayed really crystallized for you or, or do you have to work at it to bring it back? You know, uh, I don't have to work at knowing my purpose. I'm, I'm pretty certain. I'm pretty clear on what I'm, I'm here to do. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes it's, it's hard work wanting to do the purpose or going to Mm. do the work that, that, that the purpose involves. Um, but I don't know, man, I've, I've always kind of had the opinion that like, like, you know, men will crawl through broken glass if you give them a purpose. Like there's nothing, mm-hmm. if you give someone a purpose to charge after and they wholeheartedly believe in that purpose, like men will fight, die, crawl through glass and do whatever they need to accomplish it. And I think, I think that's what, one of the big things missing in modern times is that pe- people have lost that purpose. Mm-hmm. So you, you were able to, to, to claim yours. I obviously need to ask you what it is. Uh, but I, for, for people who are, are wrestling with that, you know, like, and don't want a traumatic experience necessarily to have to find it. Um, like what, what allows you to recognize that like everyone has one, I guess, Mm -hmm. because, uh, I don't like some people, you know, I think, I think most people recognize there's some reason or some purpose for us, maybe, but it's general and broad. It sounds like you're speaking specific, you know, like everybody has a specific purpose. And so yeah. what allows you to, to know that's true? And then what is yours? Um, I think it's pretty simple to find your purpose. I don't, I don't think it's as hard as people make it. Uh, I, yeah. I think if you look and, and all the people I've worked with over the years, the big things that we, that I see people and the people I see successful and find that purpose, it always has to do with someone else. It's always helping someone else. It's always doing for someone else. It very rarely, and I've never actually seen it involves them. And, and I good. truly, I truly believe that everyone's purpose on this earth is to help other people on this earth. Uh, and you just have to find what you love, what you're good at and the way you can help people the be- the most and just dive deep and charge into that. I mean, it doesn't have to be anything miraculous. It doesn't have to be anything crazy, but like, what, what is your strengths? Where, where are you strongest? And how can I use that strength to help someone else be stronger? That is some wisdom for people. Gosh, you need to just go around and do a tour in high schools and colleges and share that like two minute little thing. Cause um, that would really help a lot of people uh, uh, in those crossroad type moments. Well, it, I, I think it comes like we're teaching I think we're trying to teach people to love themselves in the wrong way because we have this whole like self-love movement of like focus on yourself, make sure you're okay first, like all these other kind of things. But everyone who does that's always still sad and they're always still lost. Yeah. And the people and the people I find it's because it's I mean, you know, if you want to do the hard thing, the hard thing is trying to love someone else, even when they don't deserve it, even even when you shouldn't, even when the society tells you that you should not love that person, the hard thing is loving that person and helping that person when they need it. And so if you truly want to do the hard thing, if you want to do the thing that's best for you, it's going to be helping other people, even if they don't deserve that help. Mm. So uh, when you think about, you know, your own life and you came out of that, you know, the, the, the surgery had the peace that you had. Uh, and now you, you identify like, you know, this gym ownership with your wife and 
Like, what is your, you know, purpose uh, beyond like the general statement of helping people? Like, mm -hmm. how would you specify it to you and in, in your life? Um, I think, I think the easy answer would be fitness. Like I'm, I'm, I'm good at it. I'm good at coaching it. I'm good at running, like hitting people in the door. I'm good at creating that community. Uh, but I, I think that's too simple of an answer. And, and I think that's too broad, to be honest. Uh, I think where, where my talent really lies and where I feel like I'm helping the most people is creating a community that allows for, for, for me and my wife to really help people outside of fitness and help people with help people with things that they're actually struggling with. It's mm -hmm. really funny. CrossFit gym owners become psychologists. They come become confidence, they become confidants. They become almost therapists to, to a point. And, you know, we, we're in this really unique position where we can listen and help people with their problems and, and try to help them direct them towards what we feel is the best and probably only solution to it's like, really finding purpose in life and so um it, it makes our job i won't say easy but it makes our job pretty clear yeah yeah so let's talk about um you know you didn't know your wife at the time mm -hmm. but now you're you're living your purpose with your wife it sounds yep. like in this gym ownership and building this community and encouraging people beyond fitness um how'd you meet her and how did you guys get aligned like were you aligned before you got married and that's why you got married? Were you, did you meet her? And then it was like, Oh no, no, this is the thing we need to do post. Cause, uh, very few, I shouldn't say very few, but it's not super common for a husband and wife to like share a purpose in a career necessarily. Mm -hmm. So I am incredibly lucky. I feel like I outkicked my coverage tremendously. Uh, she is much smarter and better looking than I could ever hope to be. <laughs> um, and we met in a competition up in Canada, uh, a wheel wide CrossFit competition um, for adaptive athletes. Uh, she had just come back from a mission trip uh, and got sick and developed a, a form of Bell's palsy. They tried to treat it, it migrated, uh, it attacked her vestibular system, causing swelling and then and a minor stroke at the age of 25. Wow. Uh, and she recovered from that. And this CrossFit competition was kind of like her jumping back into fitness like she qualified for it she's coming out to see it i'm i'm kind of older and i'm on my way out because i'm ready to retire from competing yeah. and so we met up there and uh i'll be honest Dan, i tried to hit on her the best way i knew knew how and it did not work whatsoever <laughs> um so she was living in delaware at the time i was living in colorado and we met up in, in collingwood canada uh started talking um we discussed everything from, uh, you know, comic books to, uh, you know, exercise science to theology and, and just sat there and talked for a few hours and uh, then continued to talk, you know, talk over text and the phone for a few a couple months and then started dating long distance. And, you know, again, God really blessed me in the sense that he uh, gave me a job that I had racked up like four years of travel miles. So like every nice. couple of weeks I'd, I'd fly her out or I'd fly out there and it was all on point. So we never really had to pay for it. And it was great. Wow. And, um, after six months, I convinced her that, you know, if we were going to pursue this relationship and make it uh, like a real relationship, either she needed to move to Colorado or I needed to move to Delaware and I didn't want to move to Delaware. <laughs> um, and so she, That's she moved out here, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so she moved out here. We dated for another six months and got engaged and we're married eight weeks after that. Wow. Super cool. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it was very intentional the whole way through, which is also really cool. Um, so, so then you guys were both in the CrossFit community already. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you like, when you recognized like the gym folded and uh, you know, you're going through that, Oh, maybe I should do that. Like, were you guys aligned from the get go on like doing that together? So we've only been married for, uh, going on four years now. Okay. So you uh, had it before I had, I had the gym before her. And so yeah. I built it. I had tried to build the gym, um, in the direction I wanted to build it for that many, for many years, but her coming in and helping with the gym, not only helped, it also helped solidify like where we wanted the gym to go. Um, and I, I would say very much so we were very much so aligned in what we thought the purpose of the gym would be and what it should be, um, from the mm -hmm. very beginning. So very, very lucky there. And, uh, you know, we, we understand that, that like our gym is a little different than most gyms. 
uh, and the and the people that we cater to, this the classes of people that we that we work with. Um, and so it was something she was one hundred percent on board with from the very beginning. Uh, working with specialty populations uh, from veterans to disabled individuals to people recovering from um, addiction to people getting out of the correctional facilities. Uh, we're really just kind of there to work with people who who could really use not just fitness, but the community that surrounds fitness. Yeah, which I, I think, you know, people might not say this, but truthfully, that's what everybody wants is mm -hmm. uh, some kind of community, right? And yeah, uh, that I personally, I think that's why CrossFit has thrived is because I, of the community aspect. More than very much agree. agree. Very much so agree. You, you can do you can do CrossFit anywhere. Like I go out in my parking, like in my street right, right in front of my house, you go to a park, you can do it in your garage, like you can do CrossFit anywhere, you know, because, you know, the science is there, um, but right. the fun, the fun and the accountability is in the community. Yeah. And being known, right? Like that's the other cool part about it is everybody, generally speaking, everybody's like coming to the same workout time in class. And so you just get to know people really well through mm -hmm. really hard experiences. So you get to know people really well because you see them yeah. at their weakest points, right? Yeah, so, Shared, shared suffering is a very, yeah, shared suffering is a very binding thing. Like you, you, know, you share suffering with someone and, you're, and you come close really quickly. Yeah, no kidding. Um, man, okay, I could ask you a lot of questions, but for the sake of everybody listening, uh, I'm gonna move us into that. The question I, I teased earlier, which is the, the central question for the podcast. and the purpose of it, the purpose of it being to encourage people in a hard season um, by sharing stories that other mm -hmm. people have been through hard things and come out the other side, recognizing like the value of it. And so uh, the, the way we do that is that question I mentioned, which is, uh, Kevin, what, what's the hardest thing in your life you wouldn't take back? And then the follow up to that is why. Mm. Um, and, and that's, you know, I don't know if it's the hardest thing I've ever done, but it's the hardest thing I've ever done that I know for a fact I would never take back. And that, that is the paralysis for sure. Yeah. Um, being paralyzed is not easy. It's not an easy life. It makes things quite a bit harder on just a day-to-day -day basis. You know, you like, like what kind of things can you like uh, go back the curtain a little bit? You know, like you, you have to deal with, like I deal with nerve pain down my left leg hundred percent of the time. It's never gone. It's always there. There's always some kind of pain radiating down my left like leg right now right now yeah. um you know even just something as simple as getting in and out of your car like you guys don't think about it it takes you all about five seconds if you were to leave your house get in your car you forgot something it would take you all of five seconds to run back inside and grab it for me i have to i've already broken my chair down i put it in the car next to me if i forgot something it's another couple minutes for me to get my chair back out of the car get the wheels back on it get inside come back out take it off and so there's it just takes a lot more time. There's a lot more yeah. time that's involved, a lot more planning that's involved. You know, um, a lot of people who are paraplegic struggle with like bladder and bowel control. You have to uh, figure out how to sleep different, dress different, you know, move your body around different, stay healthy different, eat different. Like everything is like being a newborn when you first start. Mm -hmm. Like even sitting up is, a, is, is hard when you first get paralyzed. Like I, the first time I tried to sit up to brush my teeth, I fell over. Like it was like- really? I, yeah, you can't, I don't have any hip flexors or abs that kind of keep me up. And so you sit up and you go to brush your teeth and you end up just falling. Oh. And so there's, it literally is like being a newborn child. Uh, yeah. But this time, this time you get to remember it. <laughs> um, and so there's a lot of that hard stuff that's associated with being paralyzed as well as like, you know, I have to plan things. Like if I, I can't just go on a trip with my wife, I have to bring medical stuff or you know, I have to worry if the place that I want to take my wife on a date is accessible and I can get in and out or if they have bathrooms I can use or if there's parking for me. And there's there's those small things that I don't think people realize about paralysis. But even with yeah. all that, there, there's there's not a ounce of me that would that if I could go back in time and change it, I would not change it. Mm. And Cause so, yeah, tell, tell us why. You find that purpose. You find what you're what God puts you on this earth to do. And if mine is what I think it is, and it's, it's working through fitness to make people happier, healthier individuals, to bring them actual joy in their life, um, you know, and aspects of bringing, you know, them, them closer to God, if, if that's what they're into, if that's what my purpose is, I've been able to reach exponentially more people 
and achieve that purpose way more from a wheelchair than I ever would have if I had not got paralyzed. Mm. And, it, and if I don't think there's a bone in me that would ever be willing to take that influence back from helping people just so I can say that I can walk again. That, that's not even trade. Wow. So uh, when you think about, cause I, so you're obviously like a man of faith. Um, yes. Have you found it to be true that uh, like, I just find this, like, this is the kingdom of God that in your greatest weaknesses, like para- paralysis or the other things that you're talking about, the things you suck at, you know, earlier mm-hmm. uh, in your greatest weaknesses is where your greatest level of influence lies. hundred percent. Yeah. I a hundred percent. So me being paralyzed means nothing. If I'm not willing to share the vulnerability of it, if I don't have, if I have people who are paralyzed or struggling with addiction or struggling coming out of the military or struggling getting out of correctional facilities, if I'm not willing to show them where I struggle and where I'm weak, my situation means absolutely nothing. If you're just like strong in the midst of it. If I am just always perfect and awesome and nothing's ever wrong, it's just super easy and I never have bad days, that doesn't help anyone. And even more so, it doesn't help me because it's not true. It's not true for anyone. And so mm-hmm. being able to be... Um, vulnerable with that stuff is is how I feel like we actually help people in our gym Mm. because if I can show them that it's okay to struggle with something because it's hard and we just have to work at the hard things but we're all going to start from a place of weakness it makes it a lot easier to get them where I need to go yeah totally and it's probably I would imagine more relatable than like let's just use you again as the example, someone who's paralyzed, who just doesn't have any issues, like what other person physically healthy or not can relate to that. Like Mm -hmm. we all know we have issues, you know? So Mm -hmm. it's like, but so let's talk about like the reality of vulnerability and our struggles and issues. Cause uh, that's not the common way of functioning in society is to like put all of our vulnerabilities on display. And so What's the, like, do you ever find yourself having to go, oh, I'm putting on a strong front. I need to like be vulnerable in this way. Or um, like, where do, do, do you find the pendulum swinging at any point? You know, if this side is like yeah. vulnerable to all extremes, this is like, I have no chinks in the armor. Um, and how do you stay kind of, you know, in a healthy middle? I mean, I think you do have a pendulum. I think you have people who, put out their vulnerabilities there specifically because they don't want to deal with them and they want someone else to help them do it. Mm. And I have, I have people, you have people on the other side who just won't admit that they're having a hard time and it makes it even harder on the person that's trying to help them. And I, I think where that middle ground lies is being honest about where you're at, but also being willing to work at it. So I'm never like, I try to never be, and I can't say that I'm never because I am stubborn and hard headed at times but I will always work towards a solution. I'm always looking for a solution. I'm always look, looking for a way for me to work towards making it better. I'm not going to rely. I'm not going to tell you like, Hey, here's all my weaknesses. I need you to fix them. But I can say, Hey, here's where my weaknesses lie. Here's why I'm vulnerable. I need your help, but I don't want you to do it for me. I want you to teach me how to fix this. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's a big difference. And, and, and then you can completely avoid like the old, um, you know, being overly stoic and not admitting something's wrong. Mm. Yeah. Tried that. Tried that. Doesn't, doesn't work. It fails miserably. <laughs> uh, I, I try that also. I, my bent is very much on the, like no chinks in the armor side yep. of things. And like to have to come to the middle of, okay, yeah, I made mistakes or I am not good at this thing or, Oh, I totally blew that is like, that's not my natural inclination. <laughs> and I don't think I marriage, don't think marriage is really yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> Pulling that out of me. But uh, I also have found, you know, like having a relationship with Jesus that like, I don't, this, this over here does me no good. This like no mm-hmm. chink in the armor side. 
when I have this, you know, relationship with Jesus who says like, Hey, check it out. You, you can't have anything I have to offer when you're sitting over here. Like, Mm -hmm. like you don't need me. And so like when I can come to this like vulnerable place and fail, all of a sudden I get like more of the goodness of, of Jesus that like, I would just be shunning when I am strong, you know, the way, the way I've always kind of seen it. And, um, you know, it's not going to be hundred percent correct, but just kind of the way it works in my brain is that on either side of that pendulum, you're rejecting God. Mm. Cause either you're saying I'm weak, I need man to help me. Or you're saying I'm strong. I need no one to help me. And in both versions of that, we're trusting in man or trusting in ourselves. And instead of coming to the center and what I found him the way I made the way that it helped me the most is the more I would pray and ask God for help with my weaknesses the easier it was for me to ask someone else or he would provide someone else to help me with my weaknesses. I mean, in all, in all fairness. And uh, I don't know how many people actually know this part of my story. Um, Part of the, part of the reason for the gym is because we really do believe that me and my wife believe that it's our mission field. Like that's where we're going to do the most influencing and be able to talk to the most people and to be able to show the most love throughout our lives. And I was running that mission field from 2015 to 2018 by myself. And mm. I, I mean, I had people who were working for me and people who were helping, but that mission field was mine and mine alone. And it was, and I was on this side, I was on the side of, you know, I have this mission. I have this purpose. I'm not asking anyone else for help. And it, and it crushed me. And, you know, I remember having, you know, uh, I don't know how many people have done this before and it may sound crazy to others, but like actual screaming matches with God. Oh yeah, um, totally. <laughs> and I remember the phrase I, I used was you either send someone to help me with this or you let me stop. Yeah. And I met, I literally met Shannon a month later. That's so cool. And I think he was just waiting for me to ask for help. Hmm. And it, it like, that's that breaking point was great for me. Cause from there on out, like I knew that if I asked for help, I would receive it. And now it's not always like finding the perfect woman a month later, but it's always like <laughs> something happens that allows me to receive help. And so that, that middle ground is, I think is where you find the most trust in God. Like, you know, yeah. you're not rejecting him and relying on a man and you're not rejecting him and relying on self. Right. And I think on, you know, on the, the, relying on man side too there's the like i'm beyond help you know Mm -hmm. like the the woe is me shame victim all the negative things that exist where it's like why i was talking to someone the other day it's like why would god want to help me you know and Mm -hmm. uh like that's also not like you can't function in that place you know yeah and so it's it's really hard to get out of there and it's hard to help that person very much yeah and so um so, so talk about, uh, you know, being paralyzed is a really difficult thing, but you wouldn't take it back. Mm-hmm. You know, that's like a, that's a huge statement. And, uh, so for, for somebody who maybe they just became paralyzed or maybe they're still wrestling with like wishing life was different, like what advice do you have? And it could be, maybe someone's in a difficult, other difficult season, but they're in it right now. Like what advice do you have for somebody wow. Who hasn't uh, gotten to the other side of it. You know, I talked to, I go, so Craig hospital, which is where I did my rehab is five minutes from my door. A um, lot of cool things in my story, like with the, me going to hospital where like you see God's hand, like my best friend lived next door to the vice president of the Craig hospital. So I shouldn't have gotten into Craig, but because of that, I got in the surgeon who did my surgery uh, was the second best final surgeon in the world. Wasn't supposed to be there that, that night and just happened to walk in and took my case, like just a lot of crazy stuff like that. And so it was easy for me to see on the back end, God's hand in that, you know? And so, you know, God also blessed me with a good sense of humor. I like making fun of uh, myself and like making wheelchair jokes. They're great. And, uh, hold on. What's your best wheelchair joke? Oh man, there's so many. Uh, I always tell people, <laughs> I always tell people to be nice to me because I can't stand up for myself or, uh, <laughs> the jokes are really in my wheelhouse or, uh, I go. used to, I used to be a stand-up guy, things like, you know, just yeah. Yeah. weird things like that. And so <laughs> what I, where I see people be most successful, the people that I find to be most successful, they have a few things in common. One, they do have a good sense of humor. 
two, they have a good like support system around them. Like they have a good community around them. But the ones that I have seen be the most successful have those two things and have faith in God. Mm. They're they're uh, almost exclusively Christians. Um, you know, and and what's really weird is that we like attract like. So we have a gym. I would say about 25% of our population is as uh, some kind of an adaptive athlete. Every single male par- paraplegic that we have in the gym is a Christian. And all of them are wildly successful post-injury. A lot of them have their own companies. A lot of them are now married. A lot of them found love after injury. A lot of them are incredibly happy and joyful. And if you saw them, you would say that's a successful human. Mm. And, you know, I've seen people be successful without a good sense of humor. I've seen people be good, uh, super successful with, with, uh, without a great support system, you know, just kind of charging on themselves. I have never seen someone be successful without faith in something bigger than themselves. And the ones that are most successful, are the ones that have faith in Jesus. And it's just, it's just the way it is. I mean, I've yeah. probably talked to hundreds of thousands of paraplegics over the last 10 years. Um, and it, there's that very big commonality there. Mm. What a cool testimony, uh, you know, to the goodness of God, but uh, also just like his faithfulness, right? Like he, mm. he means what he says, you know, like when you put your trust in him, like there's blessing on the other side and success, yeah. you know, I think the th- other thing that's unique about, you know, the Christian worldview is that success isn't, it's what you defined it as. It is, you know, loving God and loving people. And, you know, this, this idea of service of others, this idea of purpose is found in the service of others changes the like definition of success, right? It's not about the Mm -hmm. kingdom that you build for yourself, you know, and it's like, how is this kingdom I'm building serving the greater good, serving the person across from me? Yeah. Well, it's, what's funny. I I talked to a lot of CrossFit affiliates across, or I have a 13 state region. I talked to a lot of them. I talked to a lot of gyms there is a large number of Christians who own CrossFit gyms. Really? It's a very, it's much, much larger than I thought. I, mm. you know, and maybe it's cause I was uh, secluded, you know, and just around the people that I'm around, but not a lot of them. I didn't think there was a ton of them, but now that I talk to more and more of them, you know, you let something slip about being a Christian or like God, this or Jesus, that, and then like the floodgates open up and there's a lot of them. And I think it's because Christians have this servant leader or servant heart. And that's what CrossFit actually brings to the table. And uh, it's, it's unique. It's unique. You know, you, you walk into a lot of gyms and, you know, I've walked into more gyms than I ever thought I would and seen <laughs> like Bible verses on the wall. Hmm. Yeah. We've got one on our, we're not a gym, but we've got one on our wall back there where they're making some jump ropes. So it's uh, and on yeah. our website, I guess. So, Yeah that's really cool and probably really encouraging for you like every time you get to like see another person building their yeah it's like this weird recognition like one thing flips out and you're like here i where did ah we're great we're friends now i know what's going on yeah yeah (laughs) wow so okay so the advice is those those three kind of cornerstone pieces that need to be in place i think the biggest advice i give anyone that's going through a hard time is that yes, you're going through a hard time, but what is God teaching you through this hard time? Mm. Before I got paralyzed, I was impatient. I struggled with loving, like truly loving others, even when I didn't want to. I relied solely on myself because I was incredibly fit, incredibly physical, and I could do anything I needed to or wanted to. And so I had to sit there when I first got hurt and think, okay, this situation really sucks, but what is God trying to teach me through the situation? I am a much more patient man, which means I'm a much better husband and coach. I am much more uh, reliant on God's help and the help of others. And I, I, since I've had to go through a struggle and I've had my bad days where I really hope the people that I affected forgive me for my bad days, (laughs) it makes it easier for me to love those people on their bad days. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going through something hard, instead of thinking, and I should say it even better, Instead of praying, God, get me out of this bad day or get me out of this bad season, pray, God, teach me what you need to teach me through this bad time and through this bad season. Because you're going to have one and you're going to have another and you're always going to, something, something bad is going to happen. We're promised a hard life. It's just what scripture says. And if you always think, woe is me, 
why can't this end instead of what can I get out of this and what, what can I learn from this to serve God better? It makes it a lot easier to suffer. Like I said, people will crawl through broken glass if there's a purpose. And if I'm having a hard time or a hard day as a paraplegic and I can switch my brain to think, okay, yes, this is a hard day, but how can I use this to serve God? If my brain can connect that, suffering is not a big deal. Mm. Yeah, it all back to the word purpose, right? There is, there's meaning and significance in it. It's like, Mm -hmm. you know, as small or as, I guess as common, not small, as commonplace as it is, you know, having kids, which, uh, you know, for me is, is a very present reality with little kids. It's like, Mm -hmm. Before you have them, you look at it and you're like, wow, that looks like a really cool thing to have kids. And then you have little kids and you're like, this is really hard. Like, what am I doing? And like, but you do it because there's purpose in, in it, you know, like nobody would willingly choose to give up their life for all these like very incapable little people if mm-hmm. there was no purpose to it. Right. And, uh, and so it's like exactly your point that we have to have some kind of meaning for the difficult things we endure or take on or else we kind of wallow in it. Like it's, yeah. it's hard to move through it. Yeah. I, I think I'll put it, I, I put it this way before to people who have been struggling with something hard, finding that purpose is essential to dealing with that hard thing. If I came to you and said, Dan, I'm going to, I'm going to chop your arm off and there's, and there's no reason behind it. You'd be upset. Oh yeah. Reasonably yeah. upset. <laughs> but if I, but if I came to you and I was like, Hey, Dan, I need to cut your arm off. But it's because if we cut your arm off, your kids will live or these people will live or it serves this grand purpose. I, I would like to believe that nine out of 10 people would be like, yeah, take the sucker. Not even a question. Get this thing off me now. Like your arm or a million people, take my arm. And that's, it's still losing an arm. You're still going to suffer. But that purpose behind why you're suffering and what you're learning from that suffering and, and getting from that suffering is, is a big part of it. Yeah, that's really, it's a simple analogy, but a good one. Um, And I, you know, it's like scripturally Jesus, you know, for the joy set before him endured Mm -hmm. the cross, right? Like there was that, that statement of joy set before him is like what we're describing. This idea of purpose that's in front of us allows you to endure. And um, it has to be greater than the suffering. Well, Paul Paul tells us to, to like enjoy suffering. And when I was younger, I never got that. I was like, why would I enjoy suffering? That sounds yeah. so silly. And totally. then as I've gotten older and experienced things, like I, it, it's clicked in my brain. Like it's not, he's not telling us that we should like to suffer. He's telling us that we should like, we should what enjoy comes what comes from our suffering. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really good. So I, uh, for, for these, these podcasts, I like to wrap them up with a, uh, well, with the same question, which, is the recognition that, you know, we, we all have these kind of like signature moments of difficulty in our lives. Some of them, you know, uh, grander and have far more reaching impact than, than others. But the reality is, you know, hard things are always present in our life if we're growing. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I like to ask, uh, what's a hard thing that you're in the middle of right now, Kevin? Ooh, here comes that vulnerability, Dan. Uh, so obviously because I'm paralyzed, uh, having children is more difficult. It's not impossible, just more difficult. Um, so me and my wife have been trying to, uh, get pregnant and have kids for the last two years through, uh, through IUI, um, because of our personal beliefs on, on what IVF means and, and where, where life begins. Um, but we've been trying to go through IUI. We got more or less, I'll call it scammed by the first clinic we went to. And they, they kind of knowingly ruined our chances for three of our attempts. And you only get six. Um, Wait, like, like at each clinic or? No, six total. That's it. The drugs okay. that women, the drugs that my wife has to be on for the IUIs are supposed to be on for these IUIs. They increase the chance of her getting pregnant. After six attempts become very dangerous for her. Okay. okay. And so could, could we do more than six? Yes. Am I willing to risk more than six? No. Um, and so we only have a couple more chances left because of that clinic. Um, it's been two years of just fighting and and trying to figure this out. And so right now it's, it's that 
that struggle of infertility and, you know, what God wants us to do and, and where he's really pushing us. And, um, we're also in the process of starting to foster, like getting approved to start fostering and adopting kids alongside of going with the IUI. And so our, our biggest struggle, our big hardship right now is like, uh, for me as being the supportive husband, because you go through these IUIs, um, and they are, there's no better way to say it. They are gut wrenching because mm. you, because you, as, as me, as a man or, or any husband who's done this before, you have to watch your wife go through all these hard things, taking shots, doing this stuff, you know, going to these doctor's appointments and then they do the IUI, uh, uh, you know, procedure. And then you have to wait two weeks and it's two weeks of not knowing it's two weeks of hoping and praying that, that it worked and that this time she'll be pregnant. And, you know, there are side effects of a lot of these IUI drugs and IUI that makes a lot of these same symptoms of pregnancy. So it really kind of spikes your hope every single time you have one. And, um, and you know, the letdown when it doesn't happen is, is very real and it's very hard. Uh, mm. and you know, the first clinic had my wife on the wrong drugs and it basically caused a, um, uh, she, she never was pregnant. We never actually, she never actually conceived, but it caused a, a, basically a false miscarriage. So her body, even though there was no embryo, um, decided that they were having a miscarriage. So she basically had to go through that pain. Um, and they never warned her about it and they had all this different kind of stuff. And so right now our hardship is, um, our hard time is trusting in God that we're doing the right thing and yeah. pushing forward with IUI and the fostering and adopting. And for me personally, the hard thing is, is you know, it's, it's hard on me, you know, it's hard on me to know that my wife is struggling with this because of my paralysis and that there's not a thing I can do. And that, you know, as men, we just want to jump in and fix things, but there's nothing I can do to fix it. Yeah. I can pray. I can pray. And I can trust. Those are the two things I got. Yeah. Um, and so like right, right now that's where we're at. Mm. Well, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, that is, I don't know how, you know, I'm sure you've talked about it with other people, but, uh, it isn't like, the things that go on between couples, you know, are, sometimes it's hard to like get those out for other people mm -hmm. to hear. And cause it's, you know, it is such an intimate thing. And, uh, but it's a very real thing for a lot of people and uh, yeah. you know, the infertility and, and wanting to have kids and wrestling through like how, like, yeah. cause it is so out of your control to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, well, and, but so it's like, it's like I said, if I'm not willing I think God has me here to help others. And if I'm not willing to be vulnerable and tell them what I'm going through, then I'm not doing what God has called me to do. And that's, that's not okay by my, in my book. And so, um, you know, I've got my wife's approval to talk about some of the stuff that we're going through with that stuff. Cause you know, it's really sensitive to her, but we both yeah. agree that being able to share that with someone and to let people know that even though we are trusting in God, we are struggling with that. Um, yeah. I think hopefully even if one person gets encouraged by that, it's, it's worth sharing. Mm. that's what I was uh praying before we got on was like just one person you know mm -hmm. even if it's one person so yeah that's I'll join you in that and I'm confident God will use it so uh and I'll be praying for you guys because that's I appreciate that. like you know that is a significant thing yeah. both sides whatever the outcome you know and so um yeah I I will say you know and I hope this doesn't sound insensitive. It's, it's, it's not intended to be, but like, it's, I think it's really cool that you guys at the same time are pursuing foster and adoption type of plans. Like, yeah, I just, like, I see that like calling in scripture and uh, I just think it's a really yeah. beautiful God, thing. God made that really clear that we were going to foster and adopt kids. It was not a question of, of if, but just a when for us. Um, he just kept putting it in our face. Uh, one of my, good close friends um uh he, he grew up in israel grew up as a messianic jew uh served in the israel, israel army israeli army and i was talking to him one day and he's like do you do you and because i was t expressing my concerns about fostering and adopting and like where my struggles would be with that and he goes you have to know that within within like old testament and jewish in the jewish religion fostering and adopting is the highest calling that could ever be uh, taken upon by Christians. He's like, if you look at the way the Messianic, uh, Messianic Judaism is, is kind of, or Christianity really yeah. uh, looks at it. They're like, Jesus was adopted. Joseph was an adopted father. Um, and so we had that, we had other close friends go through adoption that we didn't know were going through adoption and encourage us. And so it's just like, we kept getting pelted with this, 
um, I ran into, um, I had become friends with this guy. I didn't know his backstory, went out to lunch and found out he was adopted and starting a nonprofit for adoption that he needed help wow. with the nonprofit side, which is I did for six years and um, hooked us up with a uh, uh, a company called project 127 that deals with like faith-based fostering and adopting and runs it through your church. And so it was kind of like yeah. everything just fell into place. And we're like, at this point in time, we were still struggling with IUI and we were trying to have our own kid first. And she looked at me and she goes, why not pursue both? You know? And, uh, the right, right now, the phrase we're using to get through a lot of stuff is, is to faithfully walk through the doors that God opens. Mm. regardless of what they are regardless of how much we want to walk through them we are trying to faithfully walk through every and any door that he opens to us well and and to go back to what we were talking about like that's success you obeyed mm-hmm. the lord right at the end of the day and whatever the outcome and uh it'll be it'll be a, a good thing it may yeah. not be the outcomes that we desire you know like but at the end of the day obeying the lord is success so yeah uh, yeah encourage you guys in that and uh yeah i I'd be praying for you guys because that is a, uh, a season that you're in. It sounds like for sure. Yeah. So, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, man. And I, I know we just met, but brother in Christ. So, yeah. Uh, hey, for people that want to get in touch with you, maybe they're, they can relate to what you said. Maybe they just want to like follow what you're up to and some of the training you do and the content you put out, like where can people mm-hmm. uh, keep up with you? Um, my email is just Kevin at cross at and I, I try to answer that as best I can, as quickly as I can. Sometimes it takes me a little longer than I'd like. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm at my gym a lot. So if you're in the Denver or Inglewood area, just stop by CrossFit Watchtower and there's a good chance I'm there because if I'm not working on the gym, I'm working on other stuff at the gym. Um, uh, if you want to learn more about the training stuff that I do, check out Adaptive Training Academy or Wheelwad, either one of those. We do all the adaptive stuff. Um. I think those are the best ways. I mean, I do have a personal Instagram, but I don't do anything on it. Like it's a whole bunch of videos of me bench pressing and making jokes. <laughs> so if people want to get a sense of your humor, they can go to your yeah. personal Instagram. Yeah. Okay. So it's Wheelwad and Adaptive. Adaptive Training Academy. Adaptive Training Academy. Okay. I'll make sure I throw all that stuff in the, the notes too for people mm-hmm. so that they can find them. But uh, yeah, hopefully some folks reach out and that it was good. Yeah, I love it. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Kevin, man. Anytime. Thanks for hopping on, sharing your story, and uh, I'm sure it will be an encouragement for for some folks. I appreciate it, Dan. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Do Hard Things podcast by Elite SRS. We hope you are encouraged today and have a newfound hope to persevere. Be sure to subscribe for more great episodes and conversations. And if you ever want to watch an episode, check out our YouTube channel, at www.youtube.com slash Elite SRS. Have a blessed day.